And I'm always reluctant, and even increasingly so, uh, and this is no false humility, because there are several people in this room who know more about my work than I do. <laughs> All right. So I hope to at least um, provide those of you who are less familiar with my work uh, with some um, uh, fragments uh, that might be useful to you. Before I continue on, I want to also say that there is a, another Robinson in this room who, without whom I could not have survived, and that's my wife, Elizabeth uh, Robinson. <laughs> I remember writing Black Marxism in uh, a small English village uh, in, outside of Cambridge called Radwinter. And uh, uh, those were very often 10 and 12 hour days when uh, indeed in the primitive uh, technology that I had available then, which was I guess a typewriter, um, I would just, uh, try to put together these, uh, these thoughts and this research that I was doing in, in England uh, about what had been achieved uh, before our time. I was talking to James Williams earlier before uh, our talk began this afternoon, and he was asking me about um, um, what are the elements which sustain uh, the kind of research that I did. And I reminded him, because he is a musician, um, of the standards set for all of us by Miles Davis, uh, that indeed I consciously thought about the complexity and the extraordinary power of Davis's work at the time um, as a model for what I was trying to achieve with language. I'll never be as elegant or eloquent as Ngugi has been with respect to uh, his native language, but um, that's because I was born in Oakland and we have no. <laughs> 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 uh, so I do the best I can. All right. While Tiffany was speaking, I was reminded of something that um, I begin my film book with and uh, uh, that might be useful to you. Um, Back at the beginning of the 17th century, um, William Shakespeare was credited with having written uh, the play Othello. And I, one of my favorite Shakespearean scholars, Virginia Vaughan, has maintained that Othello is racist, and it is not. And it was one of those reasons that I went to Othello uh, for the beginnings of, uh, of an analysis of, of what had become uh, the convention of the study of race in American film, uh, a convention established by uh, Donald Bogle <coughs> when he wrote a book which he entitled Tongs, Coons, Mulattoes. He spelled it E-S. Uh, Tom, Coons, Mulattoes, Bucks, and Men. Bogle made several claims for these five nominators. One claim he made was that they uh, confined black performance in American film, that all black performance in American film could be tracked to tongs, coons, mulattoes, bucks, and manners. And he maintained that these nominees uh, came, uh, in effect, from slavery. There are so many assumptions in this construction uh, that I had to sort of um, 
go at them one by one in order to reassemble um, what I thought we needed to know about the, the film industry, the American film industry, uh, up until World War II. One of the things I had suggested was that um, that these do not all emanate from the period of slavery, right? and that indeed the notion of slavery itself has to be um, re-examined. Re-examined in the way that I've done etymologically, because this term, of course, refers to the Slavs. And since it refers to the Slavs, it implicates the possibility that there are other than Atlantic slave systems, other systems of slavery other than the Atlantic slave trade. And, um, and so I found it necessary uh, to begin to think through uh, this notion of racial regimes. And a very convenient place to start is with this 1604 text. All right. The text is racist and it is not. The text, in effect, anticipates the emergence of the Negro. <coughs> which is a later invention of the 17th century, in a sense, among English-speaking people. But it also references an early historical period, a historical period of maybe eight or 900 years in extant, um, in which the Moor is a critical figure in the construction and the invention of, of Europe itself. So we have the valiant Moor, the Moor who demonstrates fortitude, the Moor who is noble, the Moor who is in fact a war specialist, and all of that, in fact, will be erased by the appearance of the Negro, uh, who begins to appear in colonial legislation, uh, meaning Maryland and Virginia, as early as the 1660s. And I found it curious notwithstanding that this is probably the most frequently performed of Shakespeare's plays, Othello is, found it curious that by the 1690s, um, a critical tragedian scholar, publicist, uh, would say that in effect Othello could not be a tragedy. He was disqualified because it was based on a, of a, of a absurd, an absurd premise that any white woman would marry a black man. And I revisited that same kind of assertion much later on in 1931, um, which I'll talk about momentarily. So we begin with this pre-Negro enunciation, this pre-Negro text. We know that Shakespeare had um, earlier um, constructed something which could more easily be transformed into the Negro when he wrote in the early 1590s, Titus Andronicus. Any of you read Titus Andronicus? Some of you. <laughs> but there is Aaron the Moor in Titus Andronicus, who uh, in a sense is displaced in Othello by Iago. Uh, but we'll come to that momentarily. So those of you who are not familiar with Othello, and there's always uh, that possibility, the Venetian ministry is determining how to uh, uh, employ their military in the defense of their eastern Mediterranean properties in Cyprus. And it's according to the Venetian Republic's 
constitution, no Venetian can be given this uh, assignment. In this way, Venetians, the Venetian constitution discourages the possibility of Venetian coups against the state by always appointing to its military, to head its military, someone who is foreign, someone who is alien. And Othello, of course, uh, is easily the most alien uh, figure there. But Othello is chosen because of his fortitude. Othello is chosen because he has demonstrated for nine years his capacity as a warrior, right? And his capacity as a warrior is simply a more recent kind of, of, of uh, <coughs> reference to uh, the fact that he comes from a war culture, Islam or the Moors. All right? And Islam and the Moors are, in effect, a part of, from, I guess this, what, the 8th or 9th century? Having taken command of the Mediterranean, uh, what Piran called transforming the Mediterranean to, into a Muslim lake. Uh, they are uh, responsible for this enormous transfer, transfer of culture, intelligence, text, science, etc., uh, to those peoples who are now going to become European. All right. But already with respect to race, already with respect to race, this has already been established. A racial category has already been established. All right. Human property is so frequently in uh, changed slobs that their very ethnic name has become the synonym for this condition. So the phrase African slave means literally treating Africans as if they were slaves. Literally. All right. And as Patterson had indicated in his uh, Slavery of Social Death, uh, we are not talking about one or two slave systems. We're talking about hundreds, if not over a thousand slave systems when we look at human history. Right. And so our American perspective is extraordinarily distorted because we, when the term slave is enunciated, it immediately marks blackness. Immediately marks blackness. And uh, that is not the history of slavery. 